We've got Theresa Mead here from Atlassian, who is going to talk us through how to get finance and FinOps to play nice. Over to you. FinOps has a solid foundation. They know what the role of FinOps is, thanks to the committed work of everyone that's involved. Uh, given the solid foundation, we're asking a new set of questions. Uh, we're asking, what does our scope look like with our partners? What does that mean with finance, with engineering? Um, without that definition, without knowing that scope for both finance and FinOps, those roles can and have uh, blurred together. Uh, we have to define where finance stops and where FinOps starts uh, and vice versa. So uh, I'm going to take you through my loop through this. I started 15 years ago, I'm aging myself here, um, in a true finance role. Um, I was a financial analyst. I spent almost five years doing just true finance. From there, uh, I moved into a really interesting role that combined finance and FinOps. Uh, this is when I moved over into the electronic arts world. Um, about three years into my journey at Electronic Arts, uh, we got this new uh, idea, this let's migrate uh, from a physical server infrastructure to cloud um, for our gaming. Companies at that point in the gaming world you know, manage their own data centers. They leased servers through third-party server vendors. And those were the goal to solutions. Um, Small-scale testing and development were happening uh, in the cloud compute space, mostly driven by mobile games and internal service solutions. The detailed billing report, how many of you remember that? Long, long time ago, <laughs> was the diamond mine of data at that point. We had less than 100 accounts. And there was little to no need for detail beyond what team or title had spun up that account. We relied on having a one-to-one -one relationship between account and cost owner. Multi-tenant environments were theoretical at best. FinOps was an idea in the heads of people much smarter than me. Seven years ago, I was just getting my first taste of cloud. We were starting a physical to cloud migration proof of concept. I was building models to prove that cloud could not only be more cost effective, but also more, <coughs> excuse me, more stable in supporting our players. Finance drove that discussion. I can't lay claim to being part of the official finance organization at Electronic Arts, but my team drove most, if not all, of the infrastructure finance related decisions in my company. Three years later, my first hourly scaling model of a single tenant environment was used to forecast the spend of an unlaunched title. That model was some of the best work I generated to date in my career. It included multiple regions, EDP discounts, RI savings, and a rudimentary data transfer forecast. Looking back at that model now, I see so many areas that could have been better implemented, but I also see that model as my first real foray into FinOps. Finance wanted to know what the spend would be for this specific title, and I wanted to know how to spend the least amount of money while providing the best possible experience for our players. My first finance FinOps partnership was ostensibly with myself. I played both sides of that coin, only answerable to the percent of revenue target the official finance team set for the title. I created the forecasts. I tracked the actuals. I balanced the RIs and the accounts that my titles ran in. I provided variance explanations. I partnered with engineering teams to understand the environment footprint requirements. I operated in a box 99% of my own making executed against targets I set, wrote variance explanations for actuals and forecasts that I controlled. This is not ideal. What I learned from this partnership of one is that there needs to be distinction between FinOps and finance, but that they both have to be knowledgeable about the world that they are operating in. 
This realization happened for me in October of 2021. I couldn't keep my box together. FinOps had evolved just beyond the optimization of costs through our eyes and savings plans. Tagging and cost allocation, reports and visualizations, democratization of data. All of these aspects are absolutely crucial to the one main goal of FinOps. Everyone takes ownership for their cloud usage. I understood the use case of each one of these aspects, but I'll be the first to admit the skills needed to implement these aspects correctly were well beyond not only my skill set, but also my interest. If you had asked me a year ago, would I leave EA? My answer would have been a resounding no. Obviously, that doesn't hold true today. I decided to come back to my roots. My degree is in finance. My career prior to EA was as a financial analyst. My forte at EA was in forecasting and communicating financial information with partners in a manner that they understood. Atlassian stood out in my journey back to my roots, and not just because they're a great company. Atlassian also had a major plus. They had a dedicated FinOps team and were looking for a finance candidate that truly understood AWS. They also had Mike Fuller, um, who was a mini celeb in my house at that point. Our partnership is still in the earliest of stages. It's less than six months old at this point. I'm still learning how to use the tools that Atlassian has adopted. The FinOps team is on the other side of the globe, and I'm in the middle of my first solo AWS forecast for the company. Despite all of this, the collaboration between myself and the FinOps team looks like it's much further along in that, that journey. Some of that can be credited to the fact that Atlassian is not only a distributed company, it's a company that makes collaboration tools. Um, and the rest of it can be credited to the fact that both sides of this relationship value and understand the, the, the collaboration. All right, so what makes this collaboration successful? In this case, it's that both sides of this coin see the value in the other side. Um, they both also understand the scope. Now, I'll be the first to admit that the FinOps team has had to do a lot more redirection with me than I have had to with them. You can take the woman out of FinOps, but you can't take FinOps out of the woman. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about finance scope. What is it? What do they do in this relationship? Honestly, the answer is total infrastructure spend. At the root of everything, there's more going on than just cloud. There's more going on than just compute. The finance team is the one who's responsible for total infrastructure spend. They're also responsible for communication with teams regarding total cloud spend, long range planning, modeling new initiatives and projects, calculating impact to spend and margins, determining which projects are financially viable uh, and achievable. Those two things really make a difference. Why make a project if you don't think it's going to be financially viable or achievable? Partnering with FinOps to set process and procedure regarding resource tagging, to build informative and impactful visualizations and reports. There are monthly, quarterly, and annual cadences that have to be adhered to in the finance world. We have to give reports to the board of directors, we have to provide variance explanations to accounting and product teams, and we have to give quarterly updates to forecast. So what about FinOps scope? Um, little tidbit here, Mike Fuller uh, actually helped me write this slide specifically. So hopefully we'll find all of these answers in the book as well. Cost visibility, loading in the cur, enhancing the data set, using our data pipelines to add extra business context, building reports, and inserting data into the path of our engineers for awareness, working with finance on forecasts, 
fully managed optimization programs around rates and usage, building the right reports and dashboards, engaging the engineering teams where they need to be involved, working with finance on commitment approvals and optimization performance reporting. Most importantly though, educating teams on cloud spend, engaging our AWS enterprise support to make sure that they are giving the biggest bang for their buck. So I could spout off a list of hard skills from everything from programming to SQL to Excel, but it really comes down to two soft skills that are needed to make this collaboration successful. The first is a willingness to obtain foundational understanding. And this is not just, I know AWS. It's a willingness to understand the requirements and deliverables of the other side. Finance has hard and fast deadlines. We went through a bunch of them a couple slides ago. FinOps has data integrity and completeness requirements. Finance needs to be able to explain variance to forecast. FinOps needs to be able to provide actionable and near real-time data to their partners. If we don't understand what the other side needs, we become our own blockers. The second, an ability to try new things and have them fail, and then be able to try again after learning from that failure. This is an extremely important and hard lesson I learned though not quite as quickly as I would have hoped. I'm a perfectionist. It's my biggest failing. Anyone who has worked with me can tell you that. I took every failure in the first decade of my career as a personal affront. Only recently have I learned that you learn more when you fail than when you succeed. Specifically for those of you who are in the finance world, Outside of those two soft skills, the one hard skill that has helped me excel in this most finance side of the world is you have to understand cloud computing at its root. You don't have to know why you would choose something. You don't have to know why the engineer is building what they're building, but you have to understand what it is. If someone comes to me and says, I'm going to spin up an EC2 instance, I'll probably ask them what type. But beyond that, I'm not going to understand the why or the where for most of their decisions. But without the basic knowledge of cloud computing, it's all Greek. The last thing I wanna expound on in this relationship is that just like with FinOps, it's a loop. FinOps feeds into finance, which feeds into FinOps, and that loop just keeps cycling. Finance needs the details in the CUR. The CUR is processed by FinOps. They pull in the data, they share it with us, and we use all of that data to allocate that spend to the actual end users. FinOps needs forecasts and targets from finance to know when to alert engineering teams that they're going over budget. When has something gone awry? Finance needs to understand where efficiencies can be made in either utilization or in cost. And FinOps needs to know where the guardrails are. The goal of this partnership is to provide transparency and accountability to the actual users of cloud compute. and needs to be in lockstep to achieve that goal. Ideally, this loop creates a spiral as each loop levels up both sides of the partnership. So what's on the roadmap for Atlassian? What are we doing? What are our plans? Currently, we've got a major joint effort going on where we're rebuilding forecasting from the ground up. Um, we rely on finance to drive our forecasts right now at Atlassian. And they're okay, they're directionally right, but they're not granular, they're not useful to our end users. So we're reusing, or rebuilding using our resource tagging and our cur 
to create more granular forecasts that have true meaning to our end users. Now, this isn't a short road. This is a long road. We're just about to kick off our newest fiscal year, and I'm not sure we're going to have it for the next one, but it's worth the work to be able to tie a forecast to an end user and tell them where they need to be focusing their attention is invaluable. We're also working on defining the scope and remit of both sides of our partnership, not only for FinOps in general, but within Atlassian itself. I'm a team of one right now. I've got one finance person who's an infrastructure you know, focused person. That team's going to grow over time We've got a fantastic FinOps team behind us. Additionally, on top of that, we're working on building visualizations and reports that foster the democratization of data. If we don't share data, it's not got meaning. Hidden data doesn't do anything for anyone. And if everyone can see everyone else, maybe there's a little incentive in that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Teresa. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. There you go. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience. Um, what advice would you give techies? Because I saw advice for finance, but what about the other way around? So my experience at EA is actually a really great place where I'm going to pull some advice here. As a techie, the thing I'd say, finance is not out to get you. I know that comes across, we come in guns blazing, saying, hey, save money, save money, save money. In the end, what we're really forecasting on is how do we make the most profit for the company? And to do that, we have to take focus in two directions. One is how do we make things more efficiently from the ground up? And that involves partnering with you. And the second is how do we make the things that already exist more efficient? You're gonna find that most companies are willing to pull the financial levers significantly earlier than they're willing to force engineering teams to rebuild, re-architect. Um, be patient and explain. The biggest thing that I've encountered is that engineering is going to expect finance to do all the research on their own, and most of us don't even know where to start. So finding a common language and Speaking a little bit closer to layman's English is, is going to be the best thing. And just know, we all want the best for, for whoever our customer is. Awesome, thank you. Hey, so on the finance side, what do you think is the best way to establish a budget when there's not much of a baseline? So, I'll give you the long answer, because I've done this the long way multiple times. The best way to establish a budget when you don't have a baseline is to talk to your engineers. Um, they're going to know what they need. Um, they may not know how to tell you what it's gonna cost, but if they can give you the building blocks, if they can tell you what parts of AWS, Azure, GCP they're going to need, you should be able to be, you know, referencing the cost um, price rates that are available to create a budget that, that works. And then you iterate. I can't think of a time I've gotten my first version of a forecast right. I can't say I've done that from a 10th version of a forecast right either. But your engineers know what they need. So your, your role is to take that information and pair it with the right information that you do have available. That was going to be my question. That's awesome. Thank you. Here you go. So would you describe your current role right now in finance more like, you know, a TBM kind of role? Or is this kind of the future, like an in infrastructure, right, as a finance person, right? So I understand now the fp &A, right? We have lots of people who do infrastructure today, but the whole goal is to evolve because they need to do more FinOps or that we need to think more about variable spend. So I find it interesting that you're headed back to the infrastructure side. So just curious. I think that has a lot to do more with where Atlassian is today about the, the separation um, and, and really focusing in on the infrastructure as opposed to what it would look like in a TBM world. 
Um, I do think with the way the world is migrating to cloud computing that you're going to need specialists within the finance world who truly understand it to be able to get into the more granular world that is required for not only cost forecasting, but commitment forecasting and all of that. Um, you can get to a point where you're just too much of a generalist. So I think that we're going to find that there's going to be infrastructure specialists because it's such a, a niche world that requires an engineering and technical bent as opposed to a true like operational expense type finance person. So sort of in the same vein, right? Um, we're reworking our cloud forecasting methodology as well. I'm too embarrassed to tell you what we do today. Um, but where do you see FinOps in that equation? What inputs are you expecting from them? And I know it's early days for yep. you as well. So one of the great things that the FinOps team at Atlassian does is they actually use the data that they pull in and they generate a forecast for us. Um, it's not the one we use, but they generate one for us. And we don't use it because there's a lot of it's just the existing world. There's more than just the existing spend that goes on when you're doing a true forecast. But what they do give us is an idea of whether we're heading in the right direction. Um, it takes current state and just iterates it out for us. And it gives us a baseline. And that's really what I think we should be expecting from FinOps is if we continue at our current run rates, what should we expect to be seeing six months, 12 months, heaven forbid if you're forecasting five years out at this point, but you should be able to get a good directional baseline from the FinOps team. And then what I'm getting from Atlassian um, and the FinOps team there is they are my connection to my engineers. Um, I'm still building those. I'm only about six months into my career at Atlassian, so I'm still figuring out who to talk to. So they are my connection to my engineers. Um, but that's what I expect from them, is help me figure out where my starting point should be and then working with them and the engineers, coming up with what changes we should be making to our forecasts going forward, whether that's optimization or accelerated growth, and then layering on information from our, our partners within the, the company to add net new expenditures. Awesome, thank you. All right. So I'm curious, I'm going to editorialize what you said a little bit. So you, you kind of did a rotation through FinOps, I, I would did. categorize it as, yes. right? If you were in an FLP program, right, it would be, hey, you got to come do this rotation through this practice. With you at Atlassian in, in an infrastructure managing the, the across the enterprise at this point, do you envision like organizationally making that part of your program and or having a resource? Because FinOps is finance and operations, like from a whatever that put my chew is, <laughs> but, <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so like you need that rotation through, I think. Right. And then do you see, uh, I guess, embedding a resource on that team as, as someone who's going to be a feeder into your F and PA processes or something along those lines? Um, you know, I hadn't considered it that way, but I do think that that is one way to take existing finance experts and giving them the infrastructure bent that they need. Um, I could see if you've got an established FinOps team and not half a person who's focused on it, that getting a six month stint going through a couple forecast cycles with them to understand what the data is and how they're using it and where it comes from and why it's impactful could be the beginnings of a infrastructure forecasted or infrastructurally focused forecaster. Um, that might be something that we look at at Atlassian. Um, I know right now, uh, because they're on the other side of the globe from me, um, we're looking at potentially, you know, how do we make that a closer relationship? So having a dedicated resource that is more financially minded might be a way for us to do that too. So it sounds like when you switch from EA to Atlassian, the actual responsibilities of the finance team and the FinOps teams were slightly different. Is there something that you think works better in at Atlassian or EA or, or, or responsibility that sits in one that you didn't expect to work as well there? Um, let me think about that. Um, I think, forgive me, my EA folk here. 
I appreciate the separation. Um, the owning so much of both the, the forecasting side of it, the budget world, how it impacts the company as a whole, um, being separated from the day-to-day -day in the weeds that we get within the FinOps role, having that separation is, is invaluable because you don't have to context switch. Um, I get to focus on the high level, the, the, the company uh, level view, where I can rely on the finance team to help me dig into root cause of changes and not have to personally context shift. Um, so I think that's the biggest plus about Atlassian. Now, EA gave me the skills that I have, and I will be forever grateful for that. But having that separation is, has been phenomenal for me. Awesome. Thank you. Any more questions? Over here. So I had one, which is there's a lot of visualization that needs to go on. When you're working with a FinOps team that is discrete from you, how much do you try to bring this data together and use a common platform and set of tools? So at Atlassian, we, the tools already existed. There was a visualization tool that had been chosen. There were already pipelines in place to pull data into those visualiza uh, the visualization tools. Um, I will caveat from the get-go, visualizations make no sense to me. I can't look at them and garner anything from them. It's, it's a failing. <laughs> um, I would prefer to see the massive CSV file um, with all the raw data. Um, it's a personal thing for me. So I do rely incredibly heavily on the FinOps team to understand the requirements from our partners and from within our own finance organization to create invaluable visualizations. That said, we're working on pipelines. It's one of the key things that we're doing with our forecast overhaul is making sure that we're pulling in the right data from the right sources and showing them to the right end users. One thing I'll add to that as well is from my own personal experience, never assume that a visualization that makes perfect sense to you makes perfect sense to anybody else. Um, yeah, that's a lesson I learned the hard way. So any, any further questions? We've got a little bit of time left. Anyone else? Okay. I'll try. Go for it. So it's not a personal question to you, but as you know, a bit of room for a full of finance people, I thought I'd ask a question. So there's this um, uh, maybe uh, hearsay that you can take your OPEX costs, which CloudSpend usually is, and you can pack it into like a three-year commitment, and that can be turned into a CapEx vehicle. And so you can now, you know, it doesn't hit your EBITDA. Is that hearsay? Is it real? Or is it just... Uh, hearsay. Um, that is not something that I've come across in any of the finance discussions that I've had at any company that I've worked with in an infrastructure uh, bent. Um, there's too much that changes. Um, change is inevitable. And if you went in and packaged it up once, you'd only, you'd have to be able to discreetly identify the new. And I don't know that that, that is something that any finance organization would be wanting to do, um, especially because when you think about cloud party or cloud providers and third party, those, if you stop using them, they're immediate wins. Um, you save money immediately if you stop using them. If you've turned that into a capital expense expenditure, you don't get to see those wins. You have to wait until you fully amortized unless you get buy off from accounting to change that. So I don't foresee that being something we do. Um, and I would love to talk to whoever um, mentioned that um, to see what their, their thought process was. I, I've seen someone try to do that. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> so we thought about it, but the gentleman asked the question. And it may be dangerous, but I'll be hearing that from the cloud providers. Oh. oh. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Yes.
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, are, are there any CPAs in the house, by the way? Uh, okay, I'm one. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the actual ruling is technically correct. You can do it, but to your point, you would never want to. Here's the couple cr criteria that I understand to be the case, but I've never seen anybody do it. You've got to have a dedicated instance. You can't have any multi-tenant or shared. It's got to be all to you. You have to have the technical and legal capacity to bring it on-prem and in-house at any point in time at your discretion. So if you can technically and legally have somebody provide that to you and so you can do it, and then lastly, you have to prepay it. To have a capital expense, you have to prepay costs and depreciate over time. So if you will dedicate it and get, have the ability to pull it back in and prepay it, but no one will qualify in all those categories. So it's technically possible, but it, even if you pulled all those off, you lose the benefit you're mentioning. There's no point. So anyway. There you go. You heard it here. Any further questions? Are we about time? Awesome. Right. For the third time today, I'm going to say I'm going to tell you two things. <laughs> and they're both important. The first important thing is that for the next hour-ish outside, there will be a vendor showcase. Uh, please show our vendors some love. They've contributed a lot of funding, a lot, of, a lot of sponsorship to this event. And quite frankly, they're all bringing some very, very shiny things that I think are quite cool. I've seen a couple of stuff today that blew my mind, so I'm really impressed. After that, even more importantly, from 7 o'clock onwards at the Speakeasy, there will be a big party with probably too much alcohol, lots of food, awards, and I'll be in a kilt. So have a great time. I'll see you later on. Thank you very much, Theresa Mee. Thank you. JR here from the FinOps Foundation. Thank you for watching. Please go to FinOps.org if you want to get plugged into this amazing community. And of course, hit subscribe right here on YouTube to get all the future content. Hope to see you soon.